Hello everybody, Resonance here, and today I have another expert game for you guys as part of my Break the Meta series for Age of Empires 2. Throughout this series I will be showcasing a wide variety of creative and situational strategies while evaluating how they might stack up in the current metagame. We've all seen our fair share of galley rushes and knights, so today it's time for something completely different. It's time to tame an army of wolves! Now before we begin, I want to quickly take a moment to once again thank Scission and the rest of the AOC Box team for archiving these replays for me. Also, of course, all of the matches were played on the Voobly client, and thanks to their backwards compatibility, I can still easily watch these replays. Now onto the game itself, today we'll be taking a look at one of my personal favorite bizarre strategies, the Wolf Rush. In this expert match, Chris will be playing against Halen in a 1v1 on the map Gold Rush. At the top side of the map, we have Chris playing as the Teal Huns. And on the bottom half, we have Halen, aka CNS LF, playing as the Blue Huns. Now, a strategy like the Wolf Rush is really only possible on a map like Gold Rush. And why exactly? Well, that's because there are huge clumps of wolves littered all around the center of the map. Of course, Gold Rush is a very open style map, very similar to Arabia, in that it's very difficult to wall up. The vegetation is rather sparse and is really hard to get a, a safe wall off with the center gold being like this. There's no trees at all in the middle of the map. And this is where most of the gold is, of course, that's why the map is called Gold Rush, so both players here will have to compete over the gold in the center if they want to survive. You have a little bit of gold in your base, but it's really not enough to sustain you throughout the game. It's enough in the early game, but once we start getting to the Castle Age, both players here will have to really start thinking about the center. But the center gold is not safe, you can't simply just start mining it in the Dark Age. For starters, it's a lot harder to defend than the gold in your own base, obviously, because it's very, very far away. But also... The gold is protected by packs of very hungry, dangerous wolves, and if you've played Age of Empires 2, you know all about how noxious wolves can be. They're super annoying, and if you try to build a mining camp here in the early game, all those wolves will aggro to you and just maul your villagers to death, which would be absolutely tragic. So both players here are going to avoid the middle like the plague right now, but there's something really interesting you can do with wolves. I mean, you might have noticed that, you know, when you're scouting around with your scout cavalry, right? that it doesn't actually aggro the wolves. Your scout can walk past a wolf like so. We can see here that Halen walks past this wolf. This wolf does not aggro to him, right? But if you use most other military units and if you use, you know, villagers, it will aggro the wolves. And something that's really interesting about this map compared to others, and the only reason why this is even possible, is that, like I said, the wolves are so, you know, close to each other, right? So if you took a militia at the start of the game and you happen to aggro all these wolves, you can create sort of like a train of wolves that follow your, you know, your militia. And then you could bring said wolves into your opponent's base and unleash hell on their economy. It is incredibly annoying to deal with because in the early game, these 25 HP wolves are actually quite powerful. I mean, really, they are a massive pain in the butt to deal with. And let's say you get a couple of them, uh, you know, you get like six of them in your opponent's wood line, then all of those villagers have to fight back. They're spending all this time that they would otherwise be using to go chop wood, uh, fighting back at, against the wolves, and they might as well be dead in that case, uh, since they're not actually doing anything. And if you lose a villager, that's absolutely huge in these neck-and-neck -neck pro games. It's all about those tiny incremental advantages. Even just something like a really small one villager lead, losing one villager to a wolf early on, can be game, almost. Uh, really good players will snowball an advantage like that. So, what I like to see, though, is that Chris, of course, is going to be our <laughs> our Break the Meta pioneer of today, as uh, when he was scouting around the map, he put these little palisade walls right underneath these clumps of wolves to give him just a little bit of vision so he remembers where the packs of wolves are. And what he's doing right now is he's going to train a militia uh, out of this barracks, and he's going to go look for some wolves. He's found one right here. He's going to try and start a wolf train for the Wolf Express. He wants to aggro as many wolves as he can and get them to chase after his militia and then bring them into the enemy economy. Now the funny part about this though, and what makes this strategy so very hard uh, to actually execute is that, of course, the wolves do try to kill whatever military unit you're using to do this. And, you know, on rare occasions we do see pros do this from time to time. You know, sometimes with the spearmen, sometimes with the militia. Uh, but, you know, they don't always actually end up making it. And a really good sign of a good player is if they can essentially calculate exactly how long they can get the wolves to chase their militia without it actually dying. I mean, it looks like, you know, you would assume that Chris is going for a drush here because you see him with this incredibly, you know, you see him with the early barracks, right? He's making militia, but he has no intention of using these militia offensively right now. Right now, he's trying to domesticate an army of wolves, and it's coming. Now, obviously, the first wolf, uh, 
you know, is going to do a lot of damage to this militia, and really, like, militia number one is not going to cut it in this case. However, militia number two is going to come up and grab the rest of the army. Chris right now is trying to get a bunch of wolves here. He's trying to get them, like, as close as possible so that when the second militia comes in, he can aggro as many as possible at the same time. Now, if this was a higher difficulty setting, we can see it's on standard, then you would be able to lure, you know, more wolves because the wolves would have a higher line of sight. But this is on standard, so they have actually a shorter line of sight. It does actually change between the difficulty, which is interesting to note. If they were playing on hardest, then this would be even more obnoxious. The thing here, though, is that, like, th the reason that the strategy can be really, really good, and, and it really only works, again, on Gold Rush because there's such a high density of wolves. Otherwise, you, you just don't get enough wolves for it to be worthwhile, because you do have to invest your own cash in this, right? Like, he had to make two militia here, and he didn't really accomplish anything with them right now, but he's about to accomplish something with them once he goes to lure them, and obviously, uh, you know, Halen has a similar idea here with the one spearman, which is definitely the cheaper alternative, but... You know, when you go for the militia like this, you slow down your feudal age, it takes up a lot of resources, every little bit counts, and this is, you know, certainly the most aggressive way of doing this. A spearman is really cheap and doesn't really hurt your eco that much, but a militia really, really does. This is such a good idea, though, uh, on Gold Rush sometimes, because even though you are crippling your own economy by doing this, if you do this with a militia and you get these wolves in here, you'll see exactly how close he can get before that militia goes down. This is like a free army here. This is like having like six militia, and it's time. It's time to unleash hell as the wolves inside inside Halen's economy. He's going to lose one villager immediately, and look at all of these wolves. Absolutely ridiculous. We swapped to his perspective, and he's like, what's going on? He saw, he saw the militia there for like half a second, and now suddenly his economy in shambles. Idle villagers everywhere. The wolves coming out from all sides of the map. And he's going to respond to this really appropriately, and I like this. This is the solution here, is that what you do is you take one of your villagers or something like that, and you send them on a long march across the desert alone, uh, and you just sacrifice them uh, to go lure the wolves away, because the wolves will, of course, you know, keep following that villager as long as they see it, and this way he can get those uh, wolves outside of his economy as fast as possible. Now, there wasn't actually too much eco damage here. There was quite a bit of idle time in the villagers, but he only lost one. Some really good micro here from Hale, and he manages to keep uh, most of his economy alive. He's going to lose a second one here because he had to pull these villagers away. Uh, he had to pull the wolves away, sorry, with this one villager. And But that's not going to be the end of this, actually, believe it or not. This strategy can be so very good because, again, you know, these pro games can be very, very close when you're both you know, very even skilled. And why not recruit an entirely free army of mercenaries in the middle of the map? It's not entirely free, but boy, is it a cost-efficient army, and... Oh, gee, that's unfortunate for Chris over here, as uh, it's gonna be used against him. The skirmisher that he's sending out of his own base is going to aggro all the wolves, but he's doing this on purpose, actually. He wants to pull all those wolves back into Halen's army here, and this is great. It's like as if Chris has, like, a military population of, like, 10 extra units. It's actually hilarious. The skirmisher dies right about now, and oh my god, Halen panicking. <laughs> he has a wolf pack on his on his tail. He has the train of wolves, and you know, again, in these early game fights, this can be absolutely ridiculous, especially against skirmishers, of course, because skirmishers have a minimum range. They can't attack any units that are right next to them, like these wolves, and you know, he's going for skirmishers because he's anticipating that Chris, our Teal Huns player, is going to go archers because everyone and their mother goes archers. Because, uh, well, why else would you... Okay, like, you would go archers because they don't cost gold, right? Uh, sorry, because they don't cost food, so that way you can stockpile food to advance the next age. But it looks like both of them are actually going skirmishers here to be a little bit uh, conservative on the gold side, which is going to make these wolves even more effective. All of these units are actually going to die here from Halen, and that means that all of these wolves suddenly underneath Chris's own town center and his own strategy being used against him. Now, he did lose a lot of military in his bringing these in here, but the thing with Halen right now is, look, he has 13 villagers idle for Chris. That's devastating. All those villagers are idle. He's going to have to use the town center to shoot down these wolves, and the wolves have gorged themselves right now, so they're not actually aggroing to anything, but they will do that in a second. And, well, he better kill these wolves now because he's wasting a lot of time. Like, this is serious, serious damage to his economy. All these villagers taking damage, and so much idle time. This is why you'll never see a pro play ring the town bell. They always drag a box around their villagers and then garrison it manually in the town center. And this is so that they minimize the amount of villagers that are, like, you know, not working and inside, because if you ring the town bell, then everybody gets in there, and you really just want to protect the villagers that are in immediate danger. And that's so much idle time. 14 villagers in the TC, absolutely devastating. 
Both players here going for skirms, but it looks like the Wolf Menace is indeed down. But that was actually incredibly powerful and mostly free. You might as well take advantage of all the things that the map provides to you, and in this case you can actually use the wolves to your advantage by pulling them around with cheap units you don't really care about. Now we're going to transition into a relatively standard 1v1 Hun's War on Gold Rush. I find it really interesting actually that both players here did indeed go for skirms and not archers. I realize that they don't have much gold in their own base. But by going for so heavy on the skirmishers, I mean, if we look at their food count, right, they're not getting to the Castle Age anytime soon, and that's why you'll usually see players, you know, go for more of an archer-oriented thing. Now, on the flip side, uh, Halen is actually, you know, setting up his economy so that he'll be able to advance to the Castle Age somewhat soon. It's just because he cut skirmisher production so much sooner. In fact, he's mostly cut military production entirely. The stable that he just put down probably for knights, you know, uh, as expected, and, you know, yeah, he just stopped at a couple of skirmishers here, but Chris... Still going all in on the skirmishers. I, I'm assuming it's because he thinks that his opponent is actually going to transition into archers, you know, and, and they'll do like an extended feudal war here, and then skirmishers will obviously clobber that. But that's not going to be the case in this situation. In fact, we see a stable here, which means he's going for knights, and knights, obviously the good choice here, considering that his opponent's going for mass skirmishers. Chris, the teal huns with mass skirms will not be able to deal with the, the knights at all. Really, like, knights are so good against all types of feudal age units, even spearmen, unless you have a ton of spearmen. But they're so insanely good against skirmishers, because skirmishers have a minimum range, and they deal one damage to knights. Knights have two armor, and that means that the two damage from the skirmishers is essentially nullified, just one. This watchtower will, of course, protect this gold mine, and it looks like Chris is indeed uh, taking this time to go transition into something else. He's been, like, pretty slow to transition onto gold, so that means that he has no choice but to m commit to skirmishers in the meantime, and... Well, he better get some serious damage done with this soon, because his opponent, Halen, the Blue Huns player, is indeed on his way to the Castle Age. He is at approximately 50%, and if he can defend against this really scary army of skirmishers, then he will survive and be able to do a lot of damage to Chris with those knights. Another thing that makes knights so strong is that you don't need to, like, get any techs for them to be just super good right off the bat. Like, you don't have to research a technology that allows you to produce knights. Uh, they're just good immediately. Uh, so once you, you know, build the stables, get to the castle, you can start producing knights, and, yeah, just run roughshod over your opponent, and these skirmishers won't really do anything to him. Still, though, Chris in here at the right time is going to do a lot of damage to this economy. He will be able to pick off a bunch of these villagers, force a lot of uh, idle time on them, and then make them walk all the way to another lumber camp. So it's really hard to quantify exactly how much, like, damage to the economy is actually going on right now. But trust me, it's actually massive. When you force these villagers to go off the line and then focus down the spearmen, which is smart, by the way, Halen's doing this because the Spearman is the one threat to the Scout Cavalry, which he's kind of being forced to throw in a few of them here. It's the one threat. Spearman's so, so strong against Scout Cavalry, so he has to go kill that right off the bat. But the rest of these Skirmishers, not really a threat. The Skirmishers are going to go down from Chris uh, and just kind of disintegrate here. Couple extra Scouts. Uh, again, Scout's so good against Skirms. Th this army is basically going to get cleaned up, and... You know, assuming that he gets the plus one defense upgrade, these skirms are going to be even less threatening. There's no there's no fletching for him either, and it looks like Chris is finally on his way to the castle lady. He's starting to advance right now, and producing spearmen, anticipating that the knights are on the way. We won't really see much more action from the wolves, uh, obviously, anymore at this point in the game, but the damage has been done. They were pretty important uh, in, in the beginning of this game, and they did a lot of damage and slowed down both players. So I really, really like to see that, but obviously wolves become less effective as the game goes on, and it's a big risk, you know, as to when you want to pull the wolves when you're doing it on Gold Rush. Uh, you'll see a lot of players, you know, go for, like, the Feudal Age, and then they'll take, like, a Spearman and do it, because the Spearman costs a lot less, and making a militia in the Dark Age can, can really hurt your eco. But if you get them out earlier, then you get to do even more damage, so it's a uh, you know, risk versus reward thing, and in this case, I would say it's certainly paid off. But now that we're transitioning into a standard game here, there won't really be that many wolves, as wolves don't do diddly squat against knights. In fact, most things don't, and with the all the upgrades here, plus one attack, plus one defense, and uh, the extra health from bloodlines, these knights are crazy powerful. Massing spearmen here from Chris is, of course, a good idea. Spearmen are really like your only hope against knights, but as we can see here, spearmen suck against knights. You need so many spearmen. You need upgrades on them, and I don't think Chris has any upgrades on the spearmen yet. I mean, I know he doesn't have fletching, which kind of sucks. This watchtower will protect the gold, I say that, but it has a minimum range of its own, so these knights will be able to get underneath it and do so much damage here. 
And really, the Watchtower doesn't do anything against the uh, the Knights once they have the plus one defense. If you don't have Fletching, your arrows just do nothing, and that's why you'll see when players go for something like Knights or really any type of melee unit, they will of course try and get the defense upgrades first, so they are basically immune from the town center fire and ranged attacks. Makes them so much better raiding units. Well, the Spearman not really doing too much here, as he's trying his best to go uh, deal with those knights, as the knights are going to force so much idle time. All those villagers have to go run back into the TC. These 10 villagers, they might as well not exist at this point, and all these farms as well, gone to waste. So much eco damage here done against Chris. Can he come back from this? It's going to be really tricky. I mean, look at this fight. It's really, really sad. Like, this knight can actually basically 2v1 the Spearman, and the only reason that... Ooh, so close. The only reason that Spearmen are a good counter, even though they lose one-on-one, -on -one, is it's a super cost-effective thing, right? Like, the Spearmen, they don't cost gold, and they're really, really, really cheap, so... Uh, they're very, very good against knights in the long run, but you need to have a greater number of them. Another problem with Spearmen, though, of course, is that you definitely want the Pikemen upgrade for them, so they're able to compete with knights. They're like a straight, hard counter to scout cavalry. If you can get... A couple spearmen against a scout, they will just tear that scout to shreds. But against knights, you kind of want to have that pikeman upgrade, and that pikeman upgrade is pretty expensive. You have to tech into that, and your opponent who goes for knights just kind of has the natural advantage there because he doesn't have to research the technology to make his knights like super relevant. But the spear the guy going for spearmen sure does. The problem with spearmen as well is that you, you sacrifice so much offensive presence with them, and they're very slow because you have to get the pikeman upgrade first for them to really be able to compete. But when we're talking about these, like, pretty close in numbers battles, having, like, two extra spearmen in there with a bunch of your knights can make the difference. And Chris here is still holding on. He managed to do a really good job defending against uh, all of this uh, all of this raiding, but he still has... He's still zoned off all of his farms back here, which is terrible for him. Not only that, he can't build a second town center because he went for that watchtower right there, and that's why, you know, pro players don't usually go too happy with the watchtowers. Uh, unless they are, like, tower rushing, or they are mining stone. And in this case, you know, it's really hard for Chris to mine stone. I mean, this stone mine's not safe. He's kind of, like, seeded half of his base to Halen right now, and this stone mine's not really safe either. It's at the front as well. And during this time, it's giving uh, Halen a lot of time to build up a, you know, steady, steady econo uh, economic advantage. His economy's getting quite huge. He has a town center in the middle. He also has a second town center in his base for a grand total of three, and he's going to start pushing ahead in the population department. If we compare populations, he has a solid 20 ahead, which is massive 28 minutes in the game. 20 population ahead of Chris. Uh, Chris is really far behind in this situation, and believe it or not, guys, a huge chunk of the reason that uh, Chris is so far behind is actually because all of those wolves came in there and they were underneath his TC, and we had like 14 villagers idle for like a solid minute. I, it's again, it's hard to quantify, but I swear, if you, uh, you know, if you check it out, that was really, really substantial. Having so few villagers for like a minute means you miss out on so many resources, and you don't get to the castle age in time. Your opponent gets there first, and all the pressure is on you. And and getting all those wolves into uh, Chris's base didn't really cost Halen that much. Uh, it cost him a couple of skirmishers and spearmen, but the eco damage was oh so worth it. Another reason, of course, why Chris is a little bit behind in this case is because he, like, really committed on the skirmishers. Again, I'm assuming that, like, for one, he, he wasn't going heavy on gold, because uh, I, I, I guess he thought that he, there was going to be, like, an extended feudal age war. He was a little slow to transition into gold, so he had to stick with skirms, and I think he opened with them initially, anticipating perhaps archers or his opponent to eventually transition into them, which never actually happened. Halen never transitioned into archers. He didn't really made any at all. He made a couple skirmishers at first, and then he just went straight for the castle age, which I think was brilliant, is he basically tricked Chris into thinking that there was going to be like a big old feudal war, and then Chris like overproduced uh, skirmishers, he overproduced spearmen, and that really, really delayed his castle age. Combined with the wolves, that is giving Halen a huge edge here. And we can see that the game is about to close out. Halen, with a huge army, is going to try and end the game. But Chris has a big army of his own. He's throwing in a bunch of monks. And monks are super good against knights because knights are really expensive. And if you convert a knight and use that knight to go damage your opponent, it's like killing a knight and getting another knight of your own for free. Uh, so, the longer the monks live, the better. However, the monks do indeed get absolutely mowed down by any ranged unit, uh, especially the cavalry archers, so focusing down those monks is very, very smart. 
And, well, he's got the hill advantage here, so the knights aren't going to be as strong, but he does have to pull back. His knights are still quite good against cavalry archers unless you have a lot of them. When it comes to crossbowmen and cavalry archers and whatnot, there's like a critical mass that you want to reach with them where they can gun down the knights before the knights get to you. But he doesn't quite have enough yet. He has the hill advantage, which is good, but there are a lot of upgrades for Chris. Still a lot of upgrades for Halo, and when you're, getting the, when you're making ranged units, you always want to get those ranged upgrades like Fletching, so you can get the first shot on your opponent. And you also, uh, yeah, the extra damage is really, really good. It also helps nullify the fact that your opponent will probably be going for the defense upgrades on his melee units. Well, he is sitting underneath this TC. Chris actually kind of mopping up Halen's army. Halen has a huge economy lead, but it might not be enough, as the military from Chris is also massive. Chris only on one TC, so he can't keep this up forever, but when your opponent goes for, you know, the three TCs, like we have right here from our Blue Hunts player, Halen, he's actually, he has a fourth TC right now, so that's, that's pretty greedy, but I like this. I, I support Farming Simulator wholeheartedly. Chris here, though, kind of all in. Like, he is, you know, he's going to have, like, a more devastating military. You know, if we take a look at the military population, his military population is almost assuredly higher. Yeah, it's much, much, much higher than his opponent's, but his economy is absolutely in shambles in comparison so he has more money that he doesn't have to spend on uh, villagers that he can spend on his army of knights but in exchange his uh, his economy is really really weak and if he doesn't actually you know close out this game soon and get a definitive lead then it's all over on a slightly different topic about the wolves again it's important to remember that he marked the wolves location on the map with uh, uncompleted palisades just to remind him where those were and he scouted them out in advance there was a lot of planning that was uh that went into this and made it so effective however i think it's really funny that it actually backfired against chris like chris uh, hoarded all those wolves and he sent them into his opponent's base and he he did it with a militia like he did it with a militia so uh, that slowed down his feudal age right and like i already put him behind but the wolves were used against him. The wolves did way more damage to him than they actually did to Halen, because Halen responded perfectly. He didn't panic. He didn't even kill all the wolves. Because he knew that if he killed the wolves, it'd be such a waste. Why not lose one of your villagers and send all the wolves into your opponent's army? I mean, like, I love the fact that we saw, like, a tug of war with wolves in the early game uh, juggle back and forth between the two players. But, you know, since Halen didn't go with the militia at first, he got the fuel age first. He had a slight military lead. He was able to... Uh, push in, clear out Chris's guys, and bring the wolves back into Chris's own economy and just snowball this game. So many knights for Chris compared to Halen, but Halen is still able to hold the line, and un again, unlike, unless Chris can actually really close this game, he is dead as can be. Still on one town center, 36 minutes into the game, not gonna cut it in the long run. I'm assuming he's thinking of like a battering ram or like a mangonel or something, but I don't think it's going to be enough and he needs to get it out soon because he, you know, with just knights alone, he's going to need such a definitive numbers lead to be able to actually take down a town center. And this castle basically seals the deal. It is almost over for Chris here. He has to make something happen right now. And it's reached this point in the game where like once you get a big enough economy like, you know, Halen has, he's going up to five TCs. That's my boy. Five town centers. Get over that farming simulator. Get huge. Boom up. Because now he's a big enough economy that he can afford the pikemen upgrade, start massing pikemen, and this is when knights actually start to suck a little bit, or they start to suck a little bit more, because they are no longer a like extremely cost-efficient investment here. Like once you get to that late game where your opponent can go for pikemen and it won't destroy his economy. Then really like the main advantage that knights have is like massed up and you can use them for raiding, but he can't use them for raiding because his own base is being pressured and he has to take control of the middle. It is of course gold rush. This castle going up gonna basically decide it. Sure, knights can take the castle shots kind of nicely, but you know, in the long run, these pikemen will just be able to trade favorably. It's just gonna be so good for Halen's economy now that he can go make the pikemen. And pikemen, you, you really can't go for them in the early game because they uh, you have to get that upgrade for them and all those technologies. You need like multiple barracks because you need to be able to get like a larger number of them. But this is no problem for Halen. This battering ram here does not have the necessary support to go take down this castle, so I do believe that is all she wrote for Chris. Getting her speeded up a little bit. Um, it's a shame that you can't actually domesticate the wolves in the game and get like upgrades for them so they can scale to the Imperial Age. That'd be pretty sick. Uh, maybe someone will make a mod for that someday, but in the meantime, I'm satisfied with this. I still love though that Chris's plan to go for that wolf rush actually ended up getting himself wolf rushed. <laughs> Halen turned that around, flipped the situation on its head. That outside of the box thinking won him that game there. Halen knows all about all about that bizarre cheese. He sees the wolf rush. Instead of killing them all, he is Mr. Value. 
<laughs> he's Mr. Value. He takes all of the wolves and he sends them back right at Chris, who's completely unprepared for that situation. Both players here, of course, played exceptionally. I love the innovation from Chris. It was a great try. It almost worked, and he tried to make the best of a bad situation, but unfortunately, Halen was able to snowball off of a couple of great decisions, of course. Uh, Halen, you know, coming in with the skirmishers and the spearmen, which signifies that he, you know, is probably committing to a feudal war. I mean, he went for the double range, right? It makes sense that he's going for feudal war. Uh, Chris saw the two archery ranges, and yet he didn't. He sent in a couple of... He sent in a small army, uh, then the wolves came in with him, and basically the wolves were the rest of the feudal age army that he needed. He didn't really need to make anything else. He just went straight to the castle age. Chris overproduced, and the wolves just destroyed Chris's economy and allowed uh, Halen to get to the castle age first, snowball that game out of control, and clinch it out in the end. So, really well played from both players here. Poor Chris. Oh, man. Boy, did that, Boy, did that backfire at the last minute. Look at the action in this game, though. There were a lot of units killed and units lost. Constant, constant battling going on over here, but... You know, once you're on one town center and your opponent's on, like, five, and you have a smaller army size than him, that's really bad. Obviously, the the army size here from Halen was a little bit inflated because pikemen don't really cost uh, that much, so you can make a lot more than the knights. The knights are obviously worth a lot more. I mean, we can really see the difference in the in the resources collected here. It's pretty out of control. I mean, over double the economy here for Halen, so... Nicely done on his part. Uh, Chris, like, really... He, he didn't build any additional town centers because... At this point, he was kind of all in. He was already behind, you know, by the time he got to the Castle Age. He was already a few minutes behind his opponent. Almost. He was, wow, he was a little over three minutes behind. And, you know, we can see the difference in Feudal Age times as well. I, I can't stress this enough. You would not be surprised, like, you know, that... that the two militia that he made really do slow down the feudal age timing and then you can see the castle age timing slowed down so much as well so wolves op wolves op like chris didn't build any additional town centers because he was like already behind so he's kind of like banking on the fact that he could overwhelm his opponent because his opponent was investing so much money uh in the short term in his economy like halen's thinking about the long term right he's poor right now but he's gonna be rich later he's investing all the money in the economy so chris will be able to outproduce him from a military standpoint also he didn't really have too much of a choice i mean if we remember chris was getting like raided super hard by those knights that came out from halen first halen got the first knights and they just kind of devastated chris's economy i mean he never really was in a position where he could just keep booming up and if you're copying your opponent and you're behind him then uh, generally speaking you lose which is why, you know, if we remember Break the Meta Episode 1, that's why War Wagons are great in that case. Because why mimic your opponent if your opponent is already ahead? You gotta try something different. You gotta try and deviate and take risks when you're behind. And that's what Chris did here, which was the wise choice. Didn't pay off, though. Maybe next time. And the moral of the story, guys, is that wolves OP. <laughs> but sometimes when you wolf rush somebody, it can be used against you. So I hope you all enjoyed watching this video as much as I did. This was a fun one indeed. I love to see when players take advantage of like literally everything that they're given to them and you know they just try to make so much value out of something that you would never think could actually be positive for you. But wolves can be a force for good and they can essentially be a free army, an army of wolf mercenaries if you will, uh, if you put them to good use like that. So I love this outside of the box thinking. Uh, taking Gold Rush to a different level and really differentiating from the other maps. I, I, I really like the, the use of the Wolves here. It's very clever. Of course, if you enjoyed watching this video, I have plenty of other Age of Empires 2 videos on my channel, as well as videos of other games, so if you like this one, you'll probably like those as well. And, you know, of course, if you enjoyed this video, feel free to leave it a thumbs up. It helps a lot. I also do live stream regularly on Twitch TV. You can find a link to that on the screen or in the video description below. If you want to know when I'm live streaming, get in on that. I'd love to have you. You can just head to the Twitch page. You scroll underneath my video player. You can find the schedule there. Be awesome to have you. And yeah, thank you so much for watching. As always, guys, I really do appreciate the continued support. And I look forward to bringing you guys more awesome Age of Empires 2 videos. So keep your eyes peeled, and I'll see you all next time. GG, well played.